Welcome to worship with St. Mark's Lutheran Church by the Narrows. On this eighth Sunday after Pentecost, we have a very special worship service in store. We are celebrating the many gifts, um, the diversity, and uh, the full inclusion of LGBTQIA2S plus folks in our community and in our church. We're also acknowledging the harm the church has historically caused and currently causes um, people who are not straight, not cis, um, and acknowledging that I think it is an important part for our healing process as a community. In our gospel story today, we hear a parable of Jesus uh, in, interacting with a man who has been hoarding power, hoarding um, wealth and money. And he, I think in this uh, story really speaks to the greed. Um, we hold on to, and as people who have power and privilege in this world, there is an ask or many questions that come out of this gospel and then put their hooks into us and pull us into the gospel story of how we live a life that is rich towards God. And this Sunday we celebrate with all the music, our prayers, uh, and our full lives in this richness of God, of richness of life towards God. As we begin our worship, I invite us to sing our opening hymn.
my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Beloveds in Christ, through the waters of baptism, we are brought into the family of God. In this family, some are queer and some are straight. Some are trans and some are cisgender. The body of Christ is rich in divine creativity, a community of people of many genders, races, body types and sizes, abilities and hungers, each a glimpse of God from a different angle. So today, as we remember our baptism, we also remember that through this new life in Christ, we are set free to love wildly, to live with pride in who we are and what God has seen us through, and to claim the power that God has given us, to turn from everything that destroys. Let us pray together. God of life and God of love, through this gift of water, you do miraculous things. The dust of past shame and guilt are washed away. The bonds of love are restored. The possibilities of new life emerge. May it be so for us today as we remember our baptisms. May your spirit be upon this water and all who gather as we celebrate this sacred family to which you have called us. Strengthen us in love for one another as we renew our commitment to the pursuit of the kingdom of God, where all your creatures and creations are beloved and free. Amen. The grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray together. Mighty God, soften our hearts this day as we seek to hear your words and commands. In a world where we are daily confronted with ways we are different, told to make ourselves smaller for the convenience of others, teach us as your people how to celebrate your boundless diversity reflected in every person who is made in your image. To have safe spaces is to experience your saving grace. Guide us to be people of faith who are committed to learning and relearning what it means to welcome, include, celebrate, and advocate for all you call beloved. Amen. A reading from Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. I, the teacher, when king over Israel in Jerusalem, applied my mind to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to human beings to be busy with. I saw all the deeds that are done under the sun and see all is vanity and a chasing after wind. I hated all my toil in which I had toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to those who come after me. And who knows whether they will be wise or foolish? Yet they will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned and gave my heart up to despair concerning all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes one who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave all to be enjoyed by another who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What do mortals get from all the toil and strain with which they toil under the sun? For all their days are full of pain and their work is a vexation. Even at night their minds do not rest. This also is vanity. A reading from Colossians. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, chapter 13. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But Jesus replied, 
friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And Jesus said to them, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable, the land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This story is interesting. It's one of those Bible verses where you hear the man speak from the crowd, and maybe you even agree with him when you first read the passage. Jesus should tell this man's brother to split the inheritance. I'm an older sister, so splitting food and sharing things with my brother is something I am very familiar with. When I first read this story, I confess that I thought this man was completely right asking Jesus for help. But instead, Jesus, who senses the man might be acting out of greed, tells a story of a person who gained abundant crops, stored them, and felt like they could relax and be comfortable for a long time, having far more than they needed. After deciding to store his crops, he's scolded by God, who calls him a fool. Why is he a fool? He profited off of his land, he made all of his own crops. He lived comfortably for the rest of his days. That should be familiar. It's basically the blueprint for the American dream. And as people raised in a society where comfort and always wanting more than enough is the backbone of what we work for, doesn't that sound like a good thing? I think a lot of people, including myself, would say yes. We like having things. Things like money, power, clothes, pretty much anything you can get on Amazon. Our society has a love affair with things, and the love of it permeates everything. A scary reflection of this love affair can be seen in the game of life. <laughs> I'm sure many of you have played the game of life before. It's a well-known board game. Basically, the concept is that you are born, and you have to make decisions that affect your life, all the way until retirement. The really interesting thing about the game, though, is that the person who wins at the game of life is the one with the most money in the end. <laughs> you can accumulate a spouse, children, and pets in the game, and they're all converted to cash. What does this mean? Well, of course, there's the obvious answer that it's just a way to tell who won the game. But my question is, how does this show us how comfortable we are reducing the entirety of our lives, the entirety of our purpose on this earth to how much we accumulate in the end? like the man in this story. My mom is a theologian, so she has talked to me about sin since I was very little. Recently, she explained more that one definition of sin is a cycle of something bad that we have a hard time getting out of. We become trapped in this harmful pattern of action or thought. Additionally, one interesting theological understanding of original sin describes it as inheriting a system of sin that we initially are not responsible for, but as we make our own choices in life, we consciously or unconsciously become culpable. We gain responsibility for perpetuating that system that harms ourselves, others, or creation. I would say that greed is the original sin, the cycle, that our society here in America has the hardest time escaping from. Like this brother who calls to Jesus at the beginning of the story, we want things. We feel entitled to things. And in this, Jesus is telling us not to store up treasures for ourselves, but be rich to God. What does it mean to be rich to God, to turn away from these treasures? I think the solution to this is a lot more simple than it seems. Perhaps it is to turn away from the things that you have bought or the money that you have and look at the people around you. Greed is isolating and surrounding yourself with things and not people is not a happy way to live. The man in Jesus' story spends most of the story until God speaks up alone. His relationship is between him and his crop, him and his possessions. He has separated himself from others by not sharing his wealth. 
The others that he doesn't share his wealth with are an interesting extra group of characters in the story that are not mentioned. While this man is relaxed with more than he needs, there are those who he could help, his neighbors or family who might need food. This man neglects them. He ignores one of the most important things God asks us to do, to love our neighbor as ourselves. In what ways are we like the person in this story? neglecting those in our lives in need of help because it is the easier thing to do. I think one of the ways we participate in greed is by being passive in the face of injustice. The man in this story did not take money from anyone. He wasn't greedy in that way. He wasn't a thief. He simply didn't actively use his money to help anyone either. That's what made him greedy, his passivity. He could do something to help people, but chose not to because their problems didn't affect him. That is a fascinating concept and something that we struggle with a lot. I think that one of our biggest problems that I have caught myself subconsciously doing is not prioritizing other people's problems when they do not directly affect me. And I suspect I am not the only one with this issue. I've talked with people who have outright told me that they don't care about politics when it doesn't pertain to them. In this way, we can be a lot like the man in the story. We're not doing anything bad actively, but in our passivity, we are harming people. So how can we be better? In the parable, God cuts in after the man decides to relax and spend the rest of his life with his crop and says, this very night, your life is being demanded of you. On first look, it seems like perhaps God is saying that the man is facing death with the warning that any moment our life could be taken from us. Another way to read it suggests that we are accountable each day and each moment for how we live our lives. But I prefer to read it as a call. A call to do what though? I suggest that it is a call to rearrange our priorities. God is saying that our life is being demanded of us. Saying that life is about more than ourselves, our money, our privilege, our possessions. And God is demanding that we re-examine what is really important. What are we making our lives about? Have you seen or read the play A Christmas Carol? A stingy man named Ebenezer Scrooge pilfers away all his money and harms everyone around him with his greed. But he is given the opportunity to rethink his priorities. One of my favorite parts of the play that I immediately thought of when reading this passage of Luke was the part in the play where Scrooge is visited by his coworker who passed away. Scrooge says, you are a good business partner. And the ghost says to him, business? Humankind was my business. Similarly to this well-known character, we are being offered an opportunity to change what we are prioritizing. We are reminded that we are called to live a life rich toward God and we can be rich toward God by using what we have to help other people, by being rich toward those around us? Are we prioritizing things like wealth, which could divide us from people and make us accomplices in others' suffering? Or are we prioritizing our neighbor's happiness and well-being? Are we prioritizing the things that affect us only? Or are we making time to work toward the justice for those who are oppressed in ways that we are not? This reset of our priorities is important as we exit Tacoma's Pride Month, because speaking as a bisexual person, this year has been really hard for the LGBTQIA community. Laws have been put into place that regulate whether LGBTQIA people can openly be their authentic selves in the world. So, in what ways have we been like the man in Jesus's parable, harming others with our inaction? And how can we move forward being generous with our care, energy, and love, being rich to God and God's people? There are really simple ways that we can do things to show people that we support them and care about them. When I came out as bisexual a couple of years ago, my parents didn't only accept my sexuality, they decided that they were going to help me make a bi cake with the colors of the bi flag for Bisexual Visibility Day. In that way, they were rich toward God. My parents didn't simply acknowledge me. They showed me through their actions that I was accepted, loved, and celebrated. As we move out of this Pride Month, I am here to say that you are being called to be rich toward God, 
that your life is being demanded of you. In this story, God is calling you and I to be agents of justice and love. We are called to be rich toward God by doing big things like advocating for the rights of others, or by doing smaller things like baking a cake for someone to show them that they are loved. Where you have more than enough power, share the wealth. Make it your life to uplift those in need. Today, tomorrow, and forever, live in a way that is rich in God's holy, active love. It is what we are called to do. Thanks be to God. Amen. As a fire is meant for burning with a bright and warming flame, so the church is meant for mission, giving glory to God's name. As we witness to the gospel, we would build a bridge of care, joining hands across the nations, finding neighbors everywhere. We are learners, we are teachers, we are pilgrims on the way. We are seekers, we are givers, we are vessels made of clay. By our gentle, loving actions, we would show that Christ is light. In a humble, listening spirit, we would live to God's delight. Let us pray. Loving God, all your people long to be seen, named, and cared for. And all too often, the church has excluded and pushed people away, calling them other and different and names more awful than this. With the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the grace of Jesus, we confess and ask forgiveness. We proclaim with joy and love that people of all sexual orientations, gender identities, and gender expressions matter. They are beloved. That black, indigenous, and people of color matter and are beloved. That neurodiversity and differing abilities of bodies are sacred and beloved. By your spirit, help us to commit our words and actions to be one of advocacy for all people and bind us together in your holy love. Amen. People of God, hear the good news. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting mercy and grace. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. We are free to love as God loves in this world. Amen. Trusting in God's extraordinary love, we come near to the Holy One in prayer for the church, the world, and all people in need. 
spirit of wisdom, guide those who are learning more about their sexual orientation, gender identity or expression. Be present with those who have been victims of hate, those that, who have not been accepted, and those who are not able to be open about who they are. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. God of justice, teach us how to be better advocates for people of all gender identities and sexual orientations and to help them be treated equally as they should have been from the very beginning. Help all who are allies to acknowledge the ways in which we are privileged and to use our power to lift up those who are oppressed. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Creating God, you are the source of all life. Where creation cries out in distress, bring relief and renewal. Bless farmers, ranchers, distributors, and all who provide our food. Nourish the land and all its inhabitants. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Compassionate God, we pray for the, those who are sick and all who look to you for healing in body, mind, or spirit. We pray for those who love them and who are giving care to them. We lift up, especially today, Phyllis Smith, Pam Wright, Elaine Rodning, Sharon Bash, Mim and Bill Krabler, Kay Jones's mom, Katie Kutsona's mom, Ivor and Ginny Haugen, John and Dorothy Peterson, Ray Shervin Sr. and his family, and those we name you, and those we name before you now, either silently or out loud. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Consoling spirit, we think of anyone who is suffering with the loss of a loved one and we ask you to guide them through the process of grieving. We pray that they will find your comfort and peace surrounding and enfolding them. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Trusting in the one who made us, dwells in us and calls us into life. We lift up these prayers, the ones that we name and all others we carry in our hearts, trusting that you are listening, amen. We affirm our faith together with words from the Iona Abbey Worshiping Community. With the whole church, we affirm that we are made in God's image, befriended by Christ, empowered by the Spirit. With the people everywhere, we affirm God's goodness at the heart of humanity, planted more deeply than all that is wrong. With all of creation, we celebrate the miracle and wonder of life, the unfolding purposes of God forever at work in ourselves and the world. The peace of Christ be with you all. I invite you to share a sign of God's peace with those with whom you're connecting with online or in person. We are so thankful for the ways in which you are sharing your gifts in the world, um, both in your local communities and global communities and here at St. Mark's. If you would like to make gifts that support our ministry here at St. Mark's, I invite you to go to our website, smlutheran.org, and click on the tab that says Give. You'll find different options for giving uh, on that website. And we are so thankful for the ways in which you are supporting us and helping us uh, carry forth ministry in the world. Thank you. As we gather in this meal of grace, we remember that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, God of justice and accompaniment through our Savior, Jesus Christ. You made us all in your image. In the spirit of abounding love and creativity, you formed us. You sent us your advocate so that we can know how to advocate for our beloveds as you strengthen us to love and uphold one another. And so, we come to this meal and remember that in the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. He blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his followers, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup. 
he gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. At this table, make us your body. Form us to be a people of justice and peace. Fill us with gratitude and generosity that we may bear the fruit of love and word and deed. Come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, and nourish our bodies so that we may be fed. Teach us to see you, Christ, and those around us. And as we prepare this table for you, we prepare our hearts for your presence. And we pray now as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As we gather to share this meal now in our homes, I invite you to um, share communion with the words, the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Taste and see in this holy meal that God is good and full of love. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us, mercy on us, mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Mercy on us, mercy on us, mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace, grant us peace, grant May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us now and keep us in his grace from this day forth and forever. Amen. And we'll move into a time of parish life announcements now. In this week, there are a couple things that I'd like to draw your attention to, especially if you're local here in Tacoma. The first is that today at noon, we'll be having an all church picnic We'll be blessing the tiny homes which we've been building this week, uh, get to celebrate with a meal outside and um, underneath some trees so it'll be a little bit cooler. And we'll also be celebrating um, the month of pride and wrapping it up with a whole uh, set of activities and crafts and celebration. So today at noon, you are invited to join us at, uh, in our upper church parking lot for an all church picnic. As we look forward to a few things happening in the next couple weeks, I wanted to mark on your calendars that we'll be having a gun violence protest at St. Mark's. This is in collaboration and connection with other faith communities in the Tacoma area. Uh, this is a way for us to show our solidarity and support of a movement to really ending gun violence in our communities. On Sunday, August 7th, um, around 9.45 a.m. after worship in person, we'll be gathering in the narthex to um, make protest signs. Materials will be provided. All you have to do is show up. And then on Saturday, August 13th at 1 p.m., we'll be gathering outside of our church building to set up signs on the lawn that are facing the North 17th Street. Uh, these will remain in place all weekend long. If you have questions um, or would like to talk to somebody about that, either email me or go to our weekly email newsletter, The Bridge, for more information. And as you go into your week, go out in courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve God. 
trusting always in the power of the Holy Spirit and rejoicing with her. In the name of God, our Creator, Christ, our Savior, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing our sending Outside looking in, this is where grace begins. We were hungry, we were thirsty, with nothing left to give. Oh, the shape that we're in. Just when our hope seems lost, love opened the door. For us, he said, come to the table. Come join the sinners who have been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior. Sit down and be set free. Come to the table. Of misfits, these liars 
and these thieves There's no one unwelcome here So that sin and shame that you brought with you You can leave it at the door And let mercy draw you Chains and all the free, all who fall. 